I'm tired and so weary, but I must go along till the Lord will come and call, call me away. Oh yes, well the morning so bright and the land. Night, night is as black as the sea. Oh, yeah. There will be peace in the valley for me someday. There will be peace in the valley for me. Oh, Lord, I pray.
Yeah. 
everybody. Uh, thank you for being here today. And we just want to start this service out in prayer. I just ask that you all bow your heads and, and pray with me. Father, we're gathered here today uh, to celebrate a legacy uh, and the life of uh, Grandpa uh, and Leroy Burnham. God, he, from looking around the room, you can just tell uh, how many people um, he's had an impact on. And God, we just thank you for uh, this man's life. Uh, we thank you that you're the creator and you're the God of the universe. God, you give life. Uh, you allow us the time to be here, uh, to be with each other. And we thank you for this man. We thank you for everybody uh, that he's had an impact on. Um, God, so we just ask this, that you would be uh, in this time uh, for family, friends, and loved ones, that you would just uh, bless this time together. God, you're the reason for everything. Uh, the same fate awaits us all. And God, to just be with us today uh, as we celebrate uh, the life of this man. We ask all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
you would rise, uh, we'll sing some hymns to the Lord that we loved. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving seems.
Welcome, everyone. For those that don't recognize me, I'm Marcus Barnum. It's been a while since I've been back in Colorado, but it's nice to see everyone here. Um, I wish it was on better terms, but uh, welcome, and I love you guys for being here. Howard Leroy Burnham was born to Edward and Sylvia Burnham on July 23rd, 1930 in Pueblo, Colorado. He was the sixth child born and the fifth son of 10 children. He was preceded in death by his father, mother, four brothers, two of his sisters, and Bobby, his beloved firstborn son. Many of you here today know my dad as Lee and some of you even know him as Putt. He always hated his first name, Howard, and as soon as he was able to shed his childhood nickname, he went by Lee. Growing up in the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression of the 30s helped shape who he would become. As the youngest of the brothers, he was often the brunt of practical jokes, especially by his older brother, Sonny. His sisters remember him as being the quiet one and the one that their mom spoiled the most. One of his mother's favorite stories to tell was when he was eight years old. He noticed a construction site on his way to school and he was so intrigued by the process of construction that he walked there to watch the workers for two straight weeks. That was until his teacher contacted his mother as to why he wasn't attending school. It was at this tender age of eight that he also joined his older brothers in smoking cigarettes. <laughs> My grandmother used to talk about how she catered to dad's every need. He must have been quite a ladies' man because his clothes and his hair had to be perfect before leaving the house. If he wanted a certain pair of jeans for school or for work the following day, grandma would wash them and then iron them dry. Of course, this was a time when jeans had to have just the right crease. During his teenage years, he, he got a chance to drive stock cars with his older brothers. This obviously set the stage for his love of racing. He loved to go to Bandemir Speedway and watch the races live, and he spent his retirement years watching just about every NASCAR race on television. Some of my first memories as a child were of him taking me to Lakeside Speedway to watch the open wheel midgets and the modified stock cars. Dad also loved football. Many of you don't know, but he was a starting right tackle for Pueblo Central High School. In 1947, as a junior in high school, in front of a crowd of 12,000, Dad played in the game of his life the Colorado State High School Football Championship. Central beat Denver South by a score of seven to six in an exciting and hard fought battle. You can read about it in the newspaper clippings in the lobby. He was on the college scouts radar that year and had several prospects for college career. But alas, that was not to be because he decided that his high school sweetheart, Martha, was much more important and quit school after his junior year so that they could get married. My brother Bobby was born the following year when dad was just 18 years old. Dad, like most of the men in Pueblo, went to work for the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. After two years, my sister Connie was born. And then three years later, my sister Debbie was born. Life was mixed with good times and bad times during those early years raising a family. At the age of 23, he had a family of five to shelter, to clothe, and to feed. It was a very dark period in their marriage when he decided to enlist in the Army. Dad felt he could provide a better life for his children through serving in the military. He was shipped out to Germany for the better part of a year. He was able to send about $65 a month back for support. When asked what he actually did in the military, his response was always, I played football. I'm not sure that any of us know what his real job in the Army was, but Dad was not one to exaggerate or lie. He eventually was honorably discharged after serving one year because he simply could not earn enough for his family. Once back home, Dad and Martha eventually decided to end their marriage. 
Dad and Bobby moved in with Grandma, and she immediately began spoiling them both. We aren't sure if this solidified the rest of the siblings' claim that Dad was always her favorite, but it sounds about right. Dad met my mom, Eleanor, on the blind date in 1959, the summer after she graduated from high school. They went with her cousin Dolores and her husband Bloss to the drive-in. My mom said that he fell in love with her fat niece. <laughs> For a short time, he didn't tell her that he already had three kids because dad and Dolores thought that mom's aunt, Aunt Della, Dee's mom would not allow mom to date him. A year later, mom left for California to attend airline training school to become a stewardess while dad completed his apprenticeship as, as a boilermaker at CFNI. After both of them completed their training, dad moved to California as well. He worked for the Hollywood studios where he made the props for the film West Side Story. They decided to get married in 1961 and flew to Las Vegas from LA on a one engine prop job. Dolores, Bloss, and my mom's mom, known as Grandma Leela, drove to meet them in Vegas. The day before, Dad and Bloss went to rent their tuxedos, which cost an, a full $8 to rent, or you could buy it for 12. So they ended up buying them. Dad and Mom got married in a little chapel on February, February 11th, 1961, and the minister, he took the wedding photos as well as the eight millimeter film. The video apparently was hilarious because no one really knew what to do. They, they just hugged each other and kissed each other while the camera rolled. The video apparently was hilarious. Um, dad and mom kissed, and Dolores kissed dad and mom. Bloss kissed mom, then um, Bloss kissed Dolores, then dad started to go kiss Dolores, and mom was like, <laughs> the video definitely could have been a contender for America's Funniest Home Videos, I'm sure. They then rented a limousine and headed off to have a prime rib, rib dinner for five people, which at the time cost a whopping $25. They all then drove back to California that very same day. As the story goes, dad dropped mom off at their newly rented apartment in Beverly Hills and went to drop off Grandma Leela at a friend's house. When he returned, mom had fallen into a deep sleep and, was locked, and he was locked out of the apartment and he ended up spending the wedding night sleeping in the car. <laughs> Eventually, they decided to move back home to Colorado, and in 1963, my sister Lisa was born. In 1965, they moved back to California, and much to Lisa's consternation, my sister Michelle was born <laughs> that, later that year. Dad returned to a career in iron and steelwork, and that same year, they decided to return again to Denver. They just missed family too much and lived so far away. In the fall of 1966, they bought their first and only house in Westminster, Colorado. The purchase price was $13,700, for which they put down $5,000. In 2010, after 44 years and many enhancements and modifications, they finally paid off the house at a balance of $78,000. <laughs> brings, brings us to me. I was the last one to be born, of course, and the one who was doted on and spoiled the most, so say my sisters. <laughs> Since quitting school at the young age of 17, Dad's career was mainly focused on ironwork partly because he grew up in Pueblo and most of his family members worked in the industry. But also, this career gave him an avenue for his gift of creativity. Some of his work is well known in and around the Denver area. Some examples, he built the circular entrance you see at the Denver Art Museum. He created a lot of ornamental ironwork and built many of the handrails in the buildings throughout the Denver area, including staircase handrails at Denver International Airport. One of his desks 
that he made is out in the lobby for you to see. In the late 70s, he attended architectural drafting school and worked as a draftsman. But after a few years, he missed working with his hands, so he went back into the shop where he could continue to be creative and build real things and not just draw them. Because of the hard labor required in his career of choice, he, su he suffered a lot of back, hand, and knee problems. He had back surgery, hand surgery, knee surgery, and a knee replacement. Yet that didn't keep him from continuing to participate in sports that he loved as both a coach and a player. He was extremely competitive, competitive and at times rivaled the infamous Bobby Knight. For a while, he coached Little League Baseball. Mom would ask after practice where, how everything went, and he would scowl, Ugh, all the boys were crying. <laughs> he loved to play on the church men's basketball and softball teams. I remember him playing on these teams well into his 50s. I remember seeing the anguish in his eyes when he came to realize he physically couldn't play such sports any longer. In his retirement years, he fell in love with a game of golf and began working for Highland Hills Driving Range four days a week. This opp opportunity enabled him to golf for free and to collect an endless supply of golf balls. Eddie Aiken was one of his best friends and favorite golfing buddies, as was his grandson-in-law, Todd, who is singing here. His last golf outing was with Todd just in, an, in this last October. Regardless of who he was playing with, he would ask them after every shot, where's my ball? Did you see where it landed? Was it in the fairway? <laughs> if they responded that they didn't see it, he'd yell. And he'd, in, a, in, a, in a very disappointed tone, he'd say, you were supposed to watch my ball. My family and I were able to visit Denver just this past August. Among many activities that I had planned to do with my daughter and son was to spend a day with Grandpa. But what activity could we do that would keep a six-year-old and an eight-year-old entertained as well as an 87-year-old interested? <laughs> Miniature golf was the inevitable answer. As you might guess, the kids were completely on board, but it took much more prodding and cajoling to get dad to join in the fun. I haven't played putt-putt in like 30 or 40 years, he'd scoff. Yet once we hit the links, I had to shake my head in wonderment as I observed him intently reading each of the greens. <laughs> he'd pace off the approach, he'd measure the wind speed, <laughs> and he'd men mentally visualize just the right angle to make a particular difficult bank shot so as not to get caught behind one of the goofy hazards. Or, God forbid, the very worst, have the ball return back towards him from the tee and end farthest away from the hole. In the end, two of our foursome had scored hole-in-ones, Titan the six-year-old and Dad. He was ever the competitor, and you wouldn't believe the beaming smile that was produced when I tallied our scores and announced he had edged me out by one stroke. <laughs> Dad also looked forward to hunting season. He, Bobby, Jerry, and other family members would plan a big hunting trip every fall for many years. Mom says that Dad would get the deer or elk in his sights, ready to pull the trigger, and then he'd let someone else shoot it. Maybe he felt sorry for the deer, but I think this was part of his humble spirit. He led others who might have needed or wanted I wanted it more to take the shot. I remember his enthusiasm when it was his turn to be camp cook, not that the rest of us were all that excited. I think he mostly enjoyed sitting around the campfire with his brothers, his cousins, his nephews, sons, and grandsons, just talking and, and enjoying God's creation, the beauty of Colorado. When driving through Walsenburg a few years ago, he casually remarked that he had once spent the night in a Walsenburg jail. Apparently, his brother Sonny, the practical joker, had talked him into going hunting just outside of Walsenburg. What Sonny had failed to mention was that the land known to him was of private property. They hadn't been hunting long when the game warden showed up. 
Sonny darted away, and Dad was left stunned about what was going on, and he was arrested for hunting on private property. My dad's got a rap sheet. <laughs> Sonny did come the next day and bail him out, although I find it hard to believe that Dad would continue to hunt with Uncle Sonny for years forward. One of Dad's gifts, and probably the biggest pain in the neck for my mom, was his love, of, love for tinkering on old cars and trucks. He loved to buy these old vehicles from neighbors or family members, the value of, rich, the value of which ranged greatly in amount, but usually the value hinged on just how much gas was in the tank. <laughs> anyway, he'd buy them and work on them for several months, then turn around and sell them. I'm not sure why he loved this so much because it was a great source of frustration for him. He was often found beneath a car or truck with his legs sticking out, yelling after hitting his head or dropping a tool. As long as you didn't count the time, the effort, the band-aids, the miscellaneous spilt fluids, the amount spent on buying parts, and of course the amount spent on buying the correct parts, he could usually claim that he turned a profit. <laughs> I'm convinced that this is where I personally developed my aversion to anything mechanical. <laughs> he was also notorious for stopping his truck in the middle of the road because he'd spot some random nut or bolt that he just had to pick up. This man could have opened a nut and bolt museum with this collection. Everything precious to him was housed in his garage and he loved hanging out there. He even had a phone installed as well as a television. The garage was one of his favorite places to just be. Religion and church was a very important part of dad's life as well. He began listening to Herbert W. Armstrong on the radio back in the 1950s with his own father. The end time prophecy that Armstrong preached was intriguing to both of them. Along with many of his sisters and brothers and their families, he and mom eventually joined Armstrong's church, the Worldwide Church of God. This was in 1969. Major doctrine, doctrinal changes within the church took place in the mid-90s. And after spending 30 years of Sabbath and Holy Day observant, observance, along with the Old Covenant laws, dad and mom left worldwide and began attending Grace Church here in Arvada. It was during these years that dad finally began to learn about God's grace, the supremacy of Jesus Christ, and our triune God. After years of striving to overcome, he was hit with the realization that the righteousness of God demands was not something that he could earn through law keeping. God opened dad's eyes to fully understand Jesus' words on the cross. It is finished. Though dad believed he had a relationship with God for the better part of 50 years, he would, read, he would readily admit that he grew up tremendously in the grace and knowledge of the Lord over the past 10 years of his life. Dad loved, loved, loved studying Bible prophecy and was always listening to prophecy teachers as well as following current events that he saw were setting the stage for Christ's return. His prayer was that God would allow him to live until the rapture. He was so sure it was imminent that he talked about it almost constantly. In the fall of 2011, his firstborn son, Bobby, passed into glory after suffering from brain cancer. Bobby's death impacted him greatly and he began praying even more earnestly that his family would all be saved. He could not bear the thought of any of us not being with him in heaven. Around that same time, he began listening to every sermon he could find on YouTube from John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, Al Mohler, Jacob Prash, and many others. A couple of years ago, he began listening to every sermon from Applewood Baptist and Southside Bible Church as well. All of you who knew my dad well know that he was not a man of great words or eloquent speech. However, in his 80s, he began to share the gospel for the first time in his life. He would ask anyone who came to the house, be it family, friends, neighbors, or even the plumber, if they knew Jesus or if they went to church. 
many times. He got shot down, but that never deterred him from trying the next time. Jordan even recalled a time when dad was evangelizing a young man working on his water heater at the same time he stood over inspecting his work. <laughs> Between his evangelizing and mom's foot warmers, they made a pretty good ministry team. It wasn't until the last year and a half of dad's life that he started pouring himself into theology and focusing on doctrine. He began to have a deep longing to be with the Lord, which was a strong contrast from his early desire to main, remain here until the rapture. The last year of his life, we believe the Lord was preparing him for his departure from this earth. He began expressing to mom that he was ready to be with the Lord. He focused more on reading and trying to understand God's word through scripture and books of faithful, faithful men. Again, MacArthur being one of his favorite authors. One of the last books he read was Trusting God by Jerry Bridges. He was reading a lot about God's sovereignty and about heaven. We believe he began to deeply understand the words of the Apostle Paul, to live is Christ and to die is, sin, or is gain. On Monday, November 27th, dad received his heart's desire and departed his, this earth to be with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is no longer a stranger or pilgrim on this earth, but at home as a citizen of heaven. He is rejoicing with the saints in the presence of the Lord forever. He is with Bobby. He is with Annette, Uncle Paul, and many of his beloved family members. We will greatly miss him on this side of heaven, but if he were able to tell us anything at this moment, it would be to those who don't know the Lord, Jesus Christ, he would say, today, is the day of salvation. He might even quote Isaiah 55, 6, 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. A eulogy is meant to bring out the best qualities and character of a person. But we all know that no one is perfect. Dad was a man of many imperfections. His flaws of character are known to those who knew him best. He had many struggles with the flesh. His marriage was imperfect. His parenting was imperfect. And his character was imperfect. However, scripture says that he who began good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. The Lord never gave up on dad, and I know we never did. God drew him to himself. God convicted him and helped him to overcome many of the obstacles that used to hold him in bondage. The Lord blessed dad with a very long life, 87 years. Dad counted his blessings of being able to be the patriarch of a very fruitful family, including six children, 15 grandchildren, and 19 great grandchildren, and the 20th here today being born just two days after his passing. Today we are here to celebrate the life of Lee Burnham, knowing that this is not the end of life for him. Rather, it is the beginning of something that our minds cannot even begin to fathom, eternal life. To quote Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 57, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death holds no power over those who are in Christ. And dad is experiencing eternal life and, and rejoicing in the glory he is now beholding in the face of Jesus Christ.
fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I will fly away. life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore, I will fly away. For those of you who don't know, that was, uh, that was Dad's favorite song. Uh, bow your heads with me, if you would, while we pray. Our Almighty God, great is your name and greatly to be praised. As we come together as family and friends to think about the life of a husband, a father, of a grandfather, a great-grandfather, of a friend. We're reminded most of all that this is a life of a servant, of a slave of yours, and it gives us cause to praise your name. Father, thank you for the, the blessing of your work in Dad's life. We pray that uh, Everything that he's done to honor you would resound in our eyes and our hearts in a way that makes us want to do the same. Father, we pray that uh, 
as you share your love with us as you did with dad, that you would help us to share that love with one another and with the world. Because we want you glorified, we want your name proclaimed, and we want you to be exalted in all things. So we thank you for this time. We pray for this time in your word that uh, your spirit would move. And those that uh, do not know you and understand what dad understood, that you have a grace beyond compare, that you show a mercy to us that we don't deserve, and that you will be glorified through the work of your son. And in his name we pray, amen. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, my name is Sean Kissman. I am the uh, husband of Michelle. I am Lee's uh, son-in-law. Uh, Michelle is Lee's uh, fifth daughter, or, I'm sorry, fifth child, uh, and obviously his most beautiful daughter, <laughs> at least by my opinion. Uh, I have grown to love Lee as a father and I've always loved and respected, respected and addressed dad as if he were my own. I want to start by thanking some people who have worked behind the scenes this week and this day. Thank you to mom and dad's uh, small community group from uh, Grace Church in Arvada. And I'm breaking out the Kleenexes already. Um, and thank you to uh, the loving and faithful brethren here at Southside. Um, it truly has been a blessing. Thank you to all the family and friends that are here. Um, thank you for the love. Uh, thank you for the cards. Thank you for the phone calls. Thank you for the support. And may, uh, most importantly, thank you for sharing that love with mom and for dad. Dad precedes us in an, in an inebe inevitable march towards death, short of Christ's return. We all in this room will live our lives and have the same end just as Dad did. Probably at no other time than at a funeral does one contemplate his mortality. What happens after death? Well, as it pertains to dad, I can comfort you with the words of Paul, which was he was inspired to write to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And it's in the front of your, uh, your program as well as on the sheets. In verse 13, it says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. And I want to emphasize that Paul was not saying that we don't grieve, but he was saying that we don't grieve as those that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and, dead, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, who are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. These are comforting words to be sure. We don't mourn as those that have no hope, but we have hope in Christ's return with those who are dead in Christ like dad. Dad's future is secure. It's an eternity in the presence of God. And that is a comfort to us as believers. You know, when dad asked me, when dad asked me two months ago to speak at his funeral, Neither one of us imagined it would come so quickly. But dad's intent for me to speak was to emphasize and to share this hope of resurrection that dad believed in. And he wanted me to, be, to clearly share with you the opportunity that lays before all men and women. 
I think that opportunity is summarized in Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14. Christ, in what is referred to as the Sermon on the Mount, lays the choice before men. And it reads like this. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. A writer once wrote, all of man's life concentrates on man at the crossroads. Life becomes a, a life of constant decision making. I mean, even today alone, we had to decide uh, what to eat, what to wear, what to do. Life is constant decision making. Ultimately, and inevitably, there is a final choice. A choice that not only determines time, but determines eternity. That choice is the one to which our Lord speaks in these verses, the ultimate choice. And throughout history, God has set before man the choice of life and the choice of death. And let me give you some examples. To Israel in Deuteronomy 30, he says, I set before you life and prosperity and death and adversity. Choose life. Joshua in Joshua 24 says, choose this day whom you will serve. And then he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Elijah in 1 Kings 18 says, How long will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, serve him. If Baal, follow him. And then Jeremiah in chapter 20, 21 says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I have set before you the way of life, the way of death. Jesus stands at the crossroads, if you will. Choose life. Choose death. Essentially, that is what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14. John Oxenham, the British poet, wrote it this way. To every man there open a way, and ways in a way. And the high soul treads the highway, and the low soul gropes the low. And in between on those misty flats, the rest drift to and fro. But to every man there opens a highway and a low, and every man decides the way that he shall go. So our Lord here confronts man with a decision. He says, a choice must be made. And we can become uh, numb to that choice. Uh, many of you know that mom and dad live a block and a half from a railroad track. Michelle and I stayed there for a month or so when we were having a house built for us. And let me tell you, right before you were about to fall asleep, here comes the train. At first, all I could do would be frustrated, waiting for the last car to go by or for the last whistle to blow. But after a week, a strange thing happened. I didn't notice the train. I'm sure it came and it went, but I became numb to the constant passing of that train. And in our world today, with Bibles at every turn, with churches on every corner, with Christian schools and universities throughout our land, many of us have become numb to this choice. But at a funeral, at a funeral, this choice smacks us right in the face. And the matter is utterly clear. There are two choices, the narrow gate and the narrow way, and the wide gate and the wide way. That's it. There are no other alternatives, none. Now, some people might say, well, how in the world could Jesus make such a clear-cut issue about religion when there are so many religions facing man? There aren't so many, really. There are simply two religions true religion and false religion. As depicted by the wide gate and the wide path versus the narrow gate and the narrow path. There's just right and wrong. Christ doesn't state it in morally relative terms. 
what's right for you may not be right for me. Christ describes two paths, but one way to eternal life. On the one hand is the religion of our devisement, of me being a good person. That's a religion of human achievement, and it comes under myriads of titles, but it's all the same system because it spawned out of the same source, Satan himself. And he packages it in different boxes, but it's the, the exact same product. Sadly, dad tried for 30 years to keep this kind of life and failed miserably by all accounts, including his own. He kept the Sabbath, he kept the holy days, he kept the dietary laws, and never experienced the peace that comes from God that surpasses all understanding. Tragically, most of humanity is on the same road that dad traveled down for 30 years, that road of human achievement, believing they can reach eternal life through some innate capacity and capability through their own good works and good deeds. Yet on the other hand, the religion of divine accomplishment is Christianity and it stands alone. Divine accomplishment equals what Christ has done, not what we've done, and that's the contrast. Jesus is looking, or Jesus is saying, look, there are two roads marked this way to life. One is the broad road of human righteousness and the other is the narrow path of divine righteousness, of Christ's righteousness. I mean, you hear the human righteousness dripping, just oozing from the Pharisee in Luke 18 as he prays, I thank thee that I'm not like other men. He basically says, I do all these things that make me a good person. And all through that prayer, he never expressed one need to God, never one need, because he never thought he had a need, because he was so good in his own righteousness. Honestly, it makes me wonder, why did he even pray or need God? But in the corner is the man pounding on his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus wants to bring mankind to a point where man realizes his utter incapacity to please God in his own flesh. And by God's will, we see our desperation with a broken heart meek and mourning that we need the righteousness from God. This is the life that dad experienced. He knew that salvation didn't come from his righteousness. He knew he was a sinner and needed divine righteousness, Christ's righteousness. And one of his biggest concerns and what he prayed about constantly was for his family, for his family to enter in through the narrow gate. There's only one path, and that leads to what? To life. Now, that's very narrow-minded, isn't it? I mean, people would say, you know, Christianity doesn't give any room for anybody else. That's exactly right. And we don't say that because we're selfish or because we're proud or because we're egotistical. We see that there is only one path that leads to life because that's what Christ said. If God said there were 48 ways to salvation, I'd share all 48 of them, but there aren't. There is only one way, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. In Acts 4, verses 12, it says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Christ says, I am the bread of life. I am the, the way the truth, and the life. I am the door. And it's a, a definite article in the Greek, the, not a way, not a truth, but the way and the truth. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Only one, no other name, Christ and Christ alone. It is that narrow. It is that finite. There are no all other alternatives. You must enter this way only. By the gift of faith, you have to enter on God's terms 
through God's narrow gate, and Christ is that gate. He is that way. And a holy God has the right to determine the basis of salvation, and he has determined that it is Jesus Christ and him alone. Two paths, only one way to life. How do we enter? How do we go down this path? Well, thankfully, Dad knew this process firsthand. And if he were here, he'd share with you these things. First, you can't enter on your own. It is impossible. No amount of self-will, no amount of works will bring you in through the narrow gate. Romans 3, verses 10 through 11 says, There is none righteous, no, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. None absolutely nobody left to our own devices, we would always pick the wide gate and the wide path. None who seek for God. And second, it's not as simple as raising your hand and saying, I believe in Jesus, then going back on the wide road that leads to destruction. Now, I know that shocks some people, but we hear all the time that getting saved is easy. All you have to do is just believe, sign on the dotted line, walk an aisle, raise your hand, whatever. And we made it easy because we don't want other people, uh, we don't want others to suffer. The only thing is when it's all said and done, those people aren't on the right road. The narrow road is difficult. It's dying to self. It's being hated by the world. It's being a new creation. Your life will be changed if you have entered through the narrow gate. If you thought you entered the narrow gate and you don't mourn over sin, if you don't desire to see God glorified in your life, if you still love the world and all it holds, maybe you should ask yourself, am I still on the wide path? John 3.16, probably the most well-known verse in the world, rightly says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But just 20 verses later in verse 36, it clarifies what belief in Christ is. In John 3, 36, it says, he who believes in the son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the son will not see life, but rather the wrath of God abides on him. It doesn't stop at entering, but rather it's an act of entering and then walking on the path of being obedient to our Lord, our Savior. And finally, it's the work of God through Christ that brings us into the narrow gate and guides and directs us on the narrow path. The gate and the path are because of God's work, not our own. And thank God for that. Ephesians 2 and verse uh, 1 through 10 clearly lays out that work that God did in dad's life and is a simple roadmap for those at the crossroads. Let me read that to you. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the, of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. And that, if you knew dad, you knew that was his life before Christ. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in transgressions, made us alive together in, with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raises us up with him, and seats us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not as the results of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And that is the life of dad 
after entering the narrow gate. Now let me emphasize a couple of points. And if you are at the crossroads, hear these things. God, rich in mercy, makes us alive in Christ. By grace we are saved through faith and not of ourselves, but through the gift of faith. God, through his mercy, gives us the gift of faith to enter the narrow gate, to walk the narrow path. You know, our hymns today were well chosen. In Christ alone, an amazing grace, God's grace. That, my friends, is the good news. That is the gospel in a nutshell. God's grace through faith in Christ alone is the only true lasting eternal life for us all, for those that accept the gift of faith. Embrace the gift that is before you today. Don't be numb to it. Recognize that you yourself cannot obtain eternal life. Rather, as was read earlier in Isaiah, call on the name of the Lord while he may yet be found. Here are two gates, the wide and the narrow, two ways, the broad and the difficult, two kinds of travelers, the many and the few, and two destinations, destruction and life. Christ exhorts us, enter. It's an imperative in the Greek. It's as, as, it's, in, uh, as in, it's an imperative as in, do this for life. My mom told me, stay out of the street. That kind of imperative, enter the narrow gate for life. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus and receive the gift of eternal life. Dad entered, dad was saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus and given the righteousness of Christ. Dad longed for the day of Christ's return. In fact, he often spoke of the desire to see Christ's return. And dad prayed for us, that God would give us the gift of salvation that we might enter into true eternal life. Christ is calling. Enter. I began with 1 Thessalonians 4. For those of us who are believers, we do not mourn as those who are without hope. Yes, we mourn, but we also have hope. Our hope is to be united with dad in singing holy, mighty majesty and worthy is the land who was slain. Maranatha, come, O Lord, come. Let's pray. Dear God, we are, we are humbled as we come before your throne to consider who you are and how you love us and how you gave Christ to redeem us who are humiliated by our sin as we see your holiness. We praise you for your mercy and grace that cannot be contained or comprehended, but can be experienced by your gift. We pray, Father, for those that do not know you, that today will be the day of salvation that they would put aside the lust of the flesh and the lust of their minds, and they would embrace, as Dad did, the true relationship with you, to honor you, to worship you, to bow down to you for eternity. That is our hope, that is our desire, and we praise your name for that work that you bring through Christ and reveal to all men. We praise you, we thank you once again for this opportunity to see you glorified through the work of Christ. We pray that you would comfort all those that mourn 
with the hope of salvation, the hope of resurrection, the hope of eternal life, and a life of glory and praising you for eternity. We come before you to praise your name, to do these things, and to give you honor for the work and the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing the doxology, if you don't mind, so if you'd stand. Um, I do want to talk to you about what's going to happen now after the doxology. Um, I believe the doxology will be up on the screen. Uh, please be seated after the doxology. Um, the family uh, will exit, and then Dad will leave as well. And then uh, you will be dismissed uh, row by row. And if you uh, would like, you can talk to family. And uh, we will be having uh, snacks and uh, drinks in the fellowship hall. And I would encourage you to continue your fellowship uh, with us in the fellowship hall afterwards. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. 